Your Dog's Friend is a nonprofit 501c3 whose mission is to help keep dogs out of shelters by educating and supporting their humans. We promote positive method of training and behavior modification through stress-free methods. As part of that mission, we offer free webinars like the one you're about to watch. Subjects range from dog behavior, stress-free training, and other tools to help you understand your relationship with your dog. If you like the webinar, be sure to give us a thumbs up. Click the notification bell and subscribe to our channel. By subscribing, you'll be notified when future videos are posted. Now enjoy the webinar. Hello, everyone. I, I hope you're as excited to watch this webinar as I am. Um, it's a topic that we haven't covered yet. It's hard to believe, but it's true. Uh, but let me first introduce you to our speaker. Dr. Amy Pike is a veterinary behaviorist and the co-owner of Animal Behavior Wellness Center with dog trainers, a boarded behavior nurse, and veterinary behavior residents part of the team. The center has two locations, Fairfax and Richmond, Virginia. As a captain in the Army, Dr. Pike first worked with military dogs, but she then spent three years in a residency program to become one of only 90, I believe, maybe a few more now. Yeah, we're still at 90. Veterinary behaviorists in North America and I think Australia. Canada too. Yeah. So the U.S., Canada, and Australia. So we're very lucky to have her here. Um, Dr. Pike has written articles for veterinary journals, is a member of the Fear Free Advisory Committee, and presents at veterinary conferences across the country. In her Fairfax Center, she sees pets with various behavior disorders that range from mild fears to extreme aggression, compulsive disorders, and panic disorders. Dr. Pike is also working to expand prevention services with her support staff by providing socialization classes and patient handling workshops for other veterinary professionals. We are lucky to have Dr. Pike here. Um, let me, I, I know y'all are going to have a lot of questions, so please put them in chat. We will get to as many as possible. Most of them we will hold until the end. I know that you will learn a lot today. I know I will learn a lot today. So Dr. Pike, it's all yours. All right. Awesome. Thanks, Deborah. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about sociability in dogs and um, specifically why your unsocial dog is not abnormal. Um, and I give you a hint here at the at the front of the lecture. Basically, sociability is a spectrum. And, and we'll talk about the whys of that, um, of that statement uh, throughout the course of the lecture. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and um, hopefully we can get to all of them at the end. I would love to chat more about this topic. This is a new uh, lecture for me. In fact, I was telling Deborah I just finished it about an hour ago. So um, I'm not usually a last minute type of person, but today for whatever reason I was. So um, hopefully we'll all really enjoy it. So let's get started. If I could maybe move my slides. There we go. So, so how does social behavior in um, the dog and, and actually in any animal develop to include ourselves. It's a combination of nature and nurture. So nature being the genetic, um, uh, the genetic makeup of the particular individual, also things that influence uh, that animal during um, uterine development. So maternal nutrition is a component in the development of social behavior, whether or not um, the certain sex of the puppy is uh, surrounded by another sex of the puppy actually also um, influences the nature of that animal upon birth and the subsequent social behavior development. And then we have nurture and nurture really is anything from uh, postpartum on. So once the, the puppy is born, what influences are going to um, take place throughout the course of that animal's lifetime to um, develop their social repertoire and um, what their behavior really looks like. All right, so let's talk first about nature because that's of course what comes first. Um, 
Dogs are not wolves. If you haven't heard this before, you should. Um, this is a myth that will never die, it seems like. Um, and I'm sure Deborah feels the same way about this, that dogs uh, did not develop from wolves. Uh, we think that wolves and dogs actually shared potentially a common ancestor even before both of those developed, but they are not directly descendant of wolves. And all you have to do is look at the different dog breeds to determine that this is in fact true. You can tell that a pug did not descend directly from a wolf. Now there are some dog breeds that do resemble more wolfy like traits. And, and when I'm talking about traits, I mean outward manifestations. So the looks of them. So we're talking like our Huskies, um, those types of breeds. And so while there, there may be more tendencies towards wolf-like behavior, they didn't directly descend from wolves themselves and they developed independent of those traits. And I want to talk really quick about what the research says, because like I said, this is a myth about um, dogs descending from wolves that will never die. And sadly, the person um, who sort of was the uh, propagator of this myth, um, David Meck, feels very bad about uh, popularizing the, um, the term and also the uh, misleading sort of uh, statement that dogs are pack animals and that actually wolves are pack animals and that there is an alpha. So when Mech was doing his research on wolves to determine what their social um, repertoire was, he was looking at a pack of wolves, and I'm still using that terms because that's what we all use, but he was looking at a group of wolves um, that were uh, captive wolves that had been taken for a variety of reasons, whether it be injury, um, illness, abandonment by mothers, and they were in a wolf center basically. And what he did was he observed their behavior and looked at those wolves and determined that there was an, a hierarchy. So there was an alpha wolf, there was a beta wolf, et cetera, et cetera. And what he then realized later was while he looked at these captive wolf populations, none of these wolves were actually related. They were, again, brought into this captive situation by, um, you know, for a variety of reasons. And that is not what a natural wolf family actually looks like. And when we actually look at wolf families, it really is truly a family. And so we have a mother and a father wolf, and then all of their, um, their offspring. And then when the offspring become behaviorally mature or sexually mature, they move off and find their own mates and create their own little family group. And so really, even in the wolf pep population, there's no such thing as an alpha. It is more about being a mother and a father and having these, um, you know, pups that they need to teach the ropes to. So it's all about providing structure and predictability. So if we know that even wolves don't form packs, quote unquote, and that there isn't such thing as an alpha, um, why would we think that our dogs do as well, even though we already know that they are not direct descendants of wolves. So just want to kind of put that out there and hopefully, hopefully this myth will uh, in my lifetime die. <laughs> Um, so let's talk about those dog breeds. So obviously we have a lot of different dog breeds out there. Um, we've got anywhere from that little cute little pug all the way up to our more wolfy looking uh, husky dogs, German Shepherds, those types. And a lot of us in this field know that we, there are some breed tendencies. Um, Kim Brophy, who is a certified applied animal behaviorist, put out this book called Meet Your Dog. And if you haven't read this, it's fascinating. And I love this book a lot because it really kind of breaks down some of those breed tendencies that we see. So let's say we've got our herding dogs. Yes, they are going to have that tendency to herd. Does that mean that all herding dogs herd? No. Does that mean that all guard dogs guard? No. Does that mean that a terrier is going to chase and catch a rat? Not necessarily. Um, while there are tendencies, we, we also now know, and this is through actual research that was just published a couple weeks ago, um, looking at the dog genomics and um, sort of our popular breed stereotypes that are out there, and whether or not the um, genomic makeup of the dog, meaning what the dog's breed is, actually showed um, what they should, how they should behave. So, so what they looked at is they looked at the DNA of more than 2,000 purebred and mixed breed dogs, 
And they coupled that with the owner surveys. Um, they mapped the genes associated with behavioral and physical traits. And what they found that only actually one, many of the physical traits were associated with breeds, but behavior was much more variable among individual dogs. So basically what this means is that while breeds do tend to have tendencies, you can't look at a border collie and assume that that border collie is going to be biddable, that it's going to be um, a herding dog, and that's going to innately know how to do the herding, um, the herding behavior. So it doesn't determine an individual's behavior. Okay. So, so while we can look again at that group and say, as a group, yes, there is a tendency towards X, Y, and Z behavior, especially um, when it comes to kind of like social interactions. Um, we can't say that an individual dog has this behavior just because it is a certain breed. So it goes one way and not the other, if that makes sense. Um, you know, one of the things, some of the things that we look at in breeds for sociability, we know that beagles are very, very pro-social to other beagles. And, and that's probably how they are traditionally raised, whether it be in, um, you know, hunting kennels, they are group housed, they hunt in groups. Um, and so when we have an individual beagle, um, oftentimes these dogs have separation anxiety, but we don't necessarily know if that's because they are very, very pro-social to other dogs and so therefore have to live with other dogs. In fact, a lot of beagles have separation anxiety despite living with other dogs. So again, it's sort of this spectrum of even though we've got this trait, it doesn't necessarily predict what behavior we're going to see in that particular individual. And we'll talk about all the sort of whys um, for, that, um, for that it is. Um, if you're interested in this study, um, Jessica Heckman, who's one of the authors on the study, just did a really great podcast, um, and I will try and find it at the end, um, that she explains this study in layman's terms, um, and it's a really, really good listen um, if you're out gardening or something, you want to learn more about this study and sort of what it means, but also how they went about doing it, which is a really, really um, difficult, uh, long study that they did, so... All right. What about autism in dogs? I have some clients come into me and, um, you know, they say, oh, my dog is really, you know, he's not very social. He acts like an autistic child. Do we know that there is autism in dogs? And the answer is no, not definitively. Um, this study done, done by Nick Dodman, uh, who is a colleague of mine, looked at uh, serum neurotensin and CRH, which is uh, corticotropin releasing hormone. So neurotensin and corticotropin releasing hormone are both secreted under stress in individuals, whether that be humans or dogs. And both of those um, hormones actually have pro-inflammatory reactions or actions. So what they found was that children with on the spectrum with autism spectrum disorder have higher levels of neurotensin and corticotropin releasing hormone, as do tail chasing bull terriers. So tail chasing bull terriers, bull terriers is obviously a breed of dog. There is a compulsive disorder within bull terriers where they chase their tails. So compulsive disorders are um, such like an analogous version in the humans is uh, compulsive hand washing, or um, you know, if you've ever watched the movie where the the gentleman had to you know turn the lock ten times, or else you know he couldn't he couldn't go to sleep, that kind of thing. So so that's a compulsive disorder in particular that we see in bull terriers, and those dogs have a phenotype very similar to autistic children. And so the sort of interesting thing about this is that while we have this phenotype, we have this um, elevated levels of neurotensin and corticotropin releasing hormone, that doesn't necessarily mean we are diagnosing autism in dogs, okay? We don't, we don't yet have that diagnosis yet because there's so much that goes into play um, on that, uh, for that disorder. So, so we are not diagnosing this just so you know. All right, so we've talked about a lot of the nature things. Um, some of the other things that I just wrote really quickly want to mention um, as far as nature is concerned. So I mentioned uh, early on about maternal nutrition. So maternal nutrition does play a role on um, brain development of the puppies. And so if the mom was malnourished, 
let's say she was a stray on the street and, you know, she had puppies born in a shelter setting or on the street, then those puppies are going to be more predisposed to anxiety. Anxiety predisposes you to having different behavioral disorders to include an unsocial nature um, and lack of that behavioral repertoire. So, so there's that. We can also see um, the early research showed that female puppies that were in utero um, surrounded on either side in the uterus by male puppies actually had higher levels of anxiety as well. So there's all these little things that can play a role in the development way before we even get our pets um, and that we have absolutely potentially zero influence on. All right, so let's talk about the nurture. So these are the things that we're going to be able to potentially influence um, throughout the course of the animal's lifetime that play into social behavioral. All right, so you've all heard of the term of socialization. So socialization is that early opportunity to uh, encourage puppies to uh, uh, meet and greet new people, go to new places, go um, hear new sounds, et cetera, et cetera. Um, socialization is a window and I'll, let me just quickly go to this um, uh, graphic to show you. It's a window of opportunity basically between about three and 12 weeks of age. And it, depending on who you talk to, it may go up to 14 or 16 weeks of age. And that's also gonna depend on the breed of dog. We have not done social sensitive period testing in every single breed of animal. And it go, you know, there is that possibility that we could have differences between um, the breeds of dogs. So, so that socialization window is very, very short. And if you think about when we typically get our puppies, whether it be from a rescue or a breeder, it's about it between eight to 10 weeks, maybe even up beyond that socialization period after 12 weeks. So what is going to be really important is if it is a breeder that is breeding puppies, they need to be working on, on socialization during that key window of opportunity. But also if there's a foster you know, for a rescue organization that is puppy raising, that's the key window when these animals should be exposed to all of the things that they need to understand that aren't so scary in, the rest, in their world that they can be okay with for the rest of their lives. Now this includes socialization with other dogs. So one of the things that I do see quite commonly is especially dogs that are um, breeder bred and socialized is unfortunately what they're socialized to is other dogs that look just like them. So while the breeder may have, I have an Airedale puppy. So while my breeder had Airedales, she also had uh, Brussels Griffons. And so my Airedale was really comfortable with any, any dog that looked like an Airedale, um, as well as little Brussels-like dogs, because that's what she was used to before we got her. So my giant schnauzer, um, and you'll meet him later in the presentation as well, he is incredibly comfortable with any dog that is all black because that's the only thing he was ever socialized to. Unfortunately, that breeder did not do a very good job of getting him out with other types of dogs or other looking dogs. And if they're only used to that type of dog up until you get them at eight, nine weeks of age, you've got only a short window of time in which we need to actually expose them and socialize them to other types and other looks of dogs. Because you can imagine what a giant schnauzer looks like and what a little pug, you know, a little tan pug looks like, very, very different. Um, and if they're not socialized to that, that could be really scary for them. All right, so we also need to expose them um, once they get into their new family, right? So. Unfortunately, time was, and, and times are changing, thankfully, but there's still a little bit of a misconception that dogs shouldn't meet other dogs until they are fully vaccinated. Um, so sometimes veterinarians will say this, sometimes you'll, you'll read this on, you know, on the internet or whatever. And um, when you are fully vaccinated as a puppy, that's anywhere from 16 to 20 weeks of age. So that means if you're not allowed to meet any other dogs until that period of time, that window of opportunity has completely completely closed. So you are not going to be able to meet other puppies, other adults, other dogs that don't look like you because that literally that window of opportunity has been sealed shut. Now that doesn't mean that we can't um, do exposure later, but it's not socialization. And that's the big difference. So socialization literally stops at that window uh, when that window closes. And after that, it's about 
doing desensitization and classical counter conditioning, which is training really to teach the animal that those other things are not so scary. Um, Unfortunately, with social behavior, a lot of times that is one of the most difficult things for us to um, desensitize and counter condition to because number one, there are so many different types of dogs out there. Number two, um, people don't always have the opportunity to find other dogs that are also social um, that they can comfortably expose their dog to because we'll talk about dog parks and doggy daycares in a bit, but you want to make sure that obviously the dog that you're um, um, you're exposing their your new dog to is also social themselves because otherwise there could be a traumatic event. If that dog is not social and it attacks your dog, then that's the possibility that could set that dog up, your dog up for life of reactivity and anxiety associated with other dogs. Um, so again, while socialization ends at that window, the exposure does not. Um, and one of the things that I see uh, sort of second commonly, so the first is not letting dogs go greet other dogs um, or meet other dogs rather before they're fully vaccinated. The second thing that I see is that, you know, people take a puppy class and they take a socialization class and then they think they're done. And that's not when, it, like, we need to continue with this because if you had these positive experiences until about four months of age, but then that's the last thing that you do. Um, and you don't see another dog or potentially interact with another dog until 10 or 12 months of age, then you're going to be in an uphill battle because you've just spent the last, you know, six to eight months with no social skills, right? So it's not something that we need to stop there and say, "Woo, we're done. We did our job. Um, we need to continue it in a positive fashion. All right, so back to our little graphic here. So we've got that neonatal um, period shortly after birth, things that can uh, affect uh, the puppies during that time, certainly traumatic events um, along any course of the animal's lifetime can impact it. But during the neonatal period, um, maternal nutrition also plays a role. We um, Maternal nutrition as well as puppy nutrition. So let's say um, a mom has a litter of 10 pups. Well, unfortunately, she doesn't just develop two extra nipples. Dogs only have eight nipples to feed their pups. And so if she only has eight, two pups are invariably going to be left out at every single feeding time. They may be pushed to uh, to the side and have to wait until their, their siblings are done. And then when they come in to feed, then there may not be as much milk left for them. Most often, those puppies are the ones that uh, become the runts of the litter. Those runts are um, known to be more prone to develop anxiety further on. Um, I really need to do a study about this because I can't tell you how many times I hear this from my clients is when I'm going through all of these things of like, you know, how many pups were in the litter and, um, you know, did mom have really good nutrition, you know, or do they even know? And if I ask them if the puppy was the runt, they're like, oh yeah, it was the runt. And I'm like, hmm, that's really interesting because I see this so commonly. Um, and, and we know it based on the literature, but I, I would really love to see like what percentage of my cases um, where the puppy was actually the runt. So, so all of those things can really um, impact it before even the sensitive period opens. So once that sensitive period of socialization again closes, we've got what we call the juvenile period that leads into sexual maturity about a year of age. And then behavioral maturity happens between two and four years of age. And again, this depends on the dog. It also likely depends on the breed um, and likely the size of that breed as well, um, but it's roughly about two to four years of age. So what can happen along the way, unfortunately, is right here before sexual maturity, around eight to 10 months of age, again, it'll vary by dog and vary by breed, um, they go into a secondary fear period. So during this period of time, things can become very, very scary where they weren't before. So clients will say, you know, my puppy was quote unquote normal until about nine, 10 months of age. And all of a sudden, then they started showing fear or and or fear aggression towards new people, new dogs, those types of things. And so they don't understand because they're like, did I do something wrong? And no, this is a normal developmental stage. However, during that stage, we have to work very, very diligently to make sure that they get out of that phase 
as positively as possible. So like my own um, Airedale puppy is going through this period right now. She is all of a sudden very fearful of children, not my own, but other people's children, as well as other dogs. And so we're having to work very hard um, to make sure that we don't desensitize and counter conditioner to these fears so that they don't solidify so that I don't then end up with a dog that has aggression um, later on in life uh, and for the rest of its life. So, so that's something that owners need to be aware of is that, you know, again, doesn't end with socialization. We've got to work on that secondary fear period, but then also between the secondary fear period and behavioral maturity, a lot of stuff is happening too. So if we think about this in human terms, um, the behavioral maturity is when we become adults. It's when our dogs become adults, but it's also when we become adults. And if you think about that, that's around our early twenties, early to mid twenties. Um, so if you think about yourself um, from, you know, when you were a 10 or 12 year old child and what you did or did not like and were or were not scared of until you were an adult in your early 20s, those two people are pretty vastly different if you really think about it. Most kids are very, very social until they reach like junior high, high school, college age meaning they like everybody. They wanna invite every single person in their class to their birthday party. They're friends with everyone. They may not always know their name. I find that with my kids. They, they are friends with every single person in their class, but they don't know their names hard the, half the time. Um, but they love everybody. They don't have any hatred towards any other child during that time, unless, unless of course there's a bully um, and somebody's mean to them. But then when we reach junior high, high school, and especially college age, we are really solidifying what we do and do not like in other people. You know, what type of people do I want to hang out with? What types of values um, do I want to, of people do I want to hang out with? Um, do I prefer to hang out with men versus women? Or do, you know, do I like both? All those kinds of things sort of morph as we move from sexual maturity into um, behavioral maturity. And by the time we're in college, again, early 20s, um, so maybe late college, early grad school type uh, age, we really do solidify what we do and do not like in our conspecifics, so our friends that we hang out with. So we don't like everybody, right? Nobody likes everybody. We have people that we like, to, we have preferred associates is what we call it in the animal world that we like to hang out with. And dogs, and cats and uh, primates, we're all the same. We all have preferred associates. Now, some dogs are gonna have more preferred associates. Some dogs are gonna have less preferred associates. And the same is true for people. There's a reason why there are introverts and there are extroverts, okay? And we'll talk about that in more in a second. Again, about those continued positive experiences, it's not socialization. So we shouldn't even be using that term. Now you can use the term socializing, like we're going to take our dog to socialize with other dogs. That meaning we're gonna have a, you know, a group setting essentially of a social setting, but it's not socialization. So socialization really is that key window. And during this period, traumatic experiences absolutely do matter. So if a traumatic experience happens during the socialization period, it's not as important important as after the socialization period. And the reason is that at the end of that socialization period, the level of fear that an animal has versus their level of ability to cope is actually the fear is going to outweigh their ability to sort of cope with that. So, so traumatic events during socialization, most puppies, if they are normal, quote unquote, um, they can, you know, shake that off we toss a few treats and they, they're able to cope and that doesn't solidify for them. But as they age, that ability to cope with those stressors is going to be less and less as we go on. So traumatic events are really gonna be more important as we go, as we get up and especially during the fear period. So during that fear period, if they have a traumatic event, that in and of itself can be really, really impactful for the rest of their lives. Um, unfortunately, a lot of those dogs do not overcome those fears um, without really really um, intentional treatment. All right, so let's talk about dog parks. So I love this meme um, because this is what we call them in our practice is the fight club for dogs. Um, you know, the number one injury that, that veterinary um, emergency rooms see are injuries from dog parks. So, um, you know, bite, bite wounds, that kind of thing from uh, a dog having been in a dog park and getting into a scuffle. 
So why is that? Well, because we have these large open areas, sometimes small, especially in DC, sometimes they are quite small with a lot of dogs, a lot of people. Sometimes they have resources out that the dogs could fight over such as balls, sticks, um, water bowls, and not a lot of supervision. So people, owners are on their phones, they're chatting with other owners, they're just looking at all the cute puppies, they're not really paying attention to what their dog is doing, what another dog is doing, they're not recognizing body language in any way, shape or form, and we'll talk about why that's important um, in a second. And so these are really going to set our pets up for, um, for failure, because trauma events will happen in a dog park. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, um, that your dog will be potentially injured by another dog and have a trauma event, even if that trauma is just emotional trauma. So, you know, they they went to play with a dog and let's say that dog doesn't like rough play and your dog's a really rough player and the dog's gonna tell them off to say, hey, I don't like to play that way. Then that could be potentially traumatic to your dog and set them up for a life of unsocial behavior um, for, you know, for the rest, for the remainder of their lives. So what about doggy daycare? So doggy daycare is a little bit better as far as I'm concerned. Um, I have a picture of a large dinner party here because this is kind of how I feel uh, doggy daycares are. So for a dinner party, the participants have been vetted, right? Like they've received an invitation from the host. So doggy daycare, most doggy daycares, if they're worth anything, they do an evaluation of the dog that's coming in to see if it's an appropriate um, social temperament to be in a daycare setting. But um, most doggy daycares are very, very crowded. Um, they have very few human handlers compared to ratio to dogs um, here. A lot of times they don't necessarily take breaks in the middle of the day. So dogs don't play eight to 10 hours straight. Um, if you look at your dogs in your home, they sleep a huge amount. Then they go out and have a, you know, some zoomies or walk or play ball or whatever. And then they come in and nap again for a few hours. A lot of doggy daycares don't take that to, into account. So by the time that you are picking them up eight to 10 hours later, they're like a cranky toddler who has had no nap all day. Um, so while daycares can provide a safer environment for socializing with other dogs, you really have to be cautious about this because again, any trauma event experienced at a daycare could set your dog up for unsocial behavior. Unfortunately, a lot of daycares are staffed by um, novice uh, workers. They're not familiar with body language. They oftentimes, when I hear from clients like, oh, my dog got kicked out of daycare because it was, quote, aggressive, sometimes actually the case is that their dog was just responding to something inappropriate that another dog was doing. And while they used aggression as a behavioral strategy, it was inhibited and it was very appropriate because the other dog wasn't listening and there was no human handler there to actually intervene. So you just have to be really, really cautious when using um, daycare facilities to make sure that they understand um, what they should and shouldn't be doing with these animals because you don't want this to be the setting where your dog then also becomes leash reactive towards other dogs. Okay, so what is leash frustration? So um, we hear this term uh, thrown around a lot and leash frustration, what it means is we have two dogs on leash that are tr trying to greet one another, but they are frustrated for some reason. Most often they're frustrated because that leash is holding them back or their owner is holding them back or the other dog isn't friendly and doesn't wanna greet. So they become frustrated with the whole process. So how does it develop? It develops when we allow leash greetings between dogs. So um, this is one of the sort of American uh, cultural things that we do is that we allow our dogs to greet other dogs on leash. And if you've ever traveled to Europe, that is not something that they do over there. You don't greet, you don't allow your dog to greet another dog on leash. You teach your dog to ignore another dog on leash. And so if you walk down the streets of Europe, there's tons of people walking their dogs. Nobody's barking at each other. Nobody's straining at the leash to get, you know, whining, crying, frustrated to get to another dog to greet it. They're actually taught from a very, very early age not to greet another dog. It's kind of like what we do as humans. Do we greet everybody as we walk down the sidewalk? 
No. When I'm in DC, most often I'm, you know, I got my head down to the sidewalk. I've got my earbuds in because I don't want to talk to anybody. Right. Um, now, if I see somebody that's smiling at me, I may give a, a friendly smile back, but I'm not going to go, Hey friend, how's it going? Let's hug. Right. Cause I don't know that person, but that's what we make our dogs do all the time on the streets. Right. Oh, can my dog say hi? He's friendly. Well, what can happen is at best your dog could get leash frustrated but at worst, we could actually end up with reactivity. And a lot of dogs with leash frustration early on around behavioral maturity, so around two, three, four years of age, develop leash reactivity. And we're not entirely sure why that uh, frustration pushes into reactivity, but it very, very commonly does. And so now you've got a dog that is lunging, barking, growling at the end of the leash versus straining because he's whining, crying, quote unquote, wants to go greet that other dog. And so what is leash reactivity? All leash reactivity is fear-based aggression. So aggression that is based out of the emotion of fear that where we're using aggression as a behavioral strategy to say, look how big and bad I am because actually I'm kind of terrified and I don't want anything bad to happen to me. So I'm just going to look look really bad or look really big and mean. Um, so if you've ever heard of the saying of, uh, you know, the best offense or best defense is a good offense, that is this, uh, leash reactivity is a prime example of that. So how does it develop? Again, we can have leash frustration or we can have um, unsocial behavior. So we are scared of other dogs and in our world, it's fight or flight. And if I can't flee because I'm attached to my human via a six foot, four foot leash, I, my only recourse is to fight. And so that's how leash reactivity does develop is through that emotion of fear, anxiety, and stress. And they're just using aggression as a behavioral strategy. Now, some of these dogs that are leash reactive can socialize well with other dogs off leash. So these are the dogs that, you know, you can take them to the dog park, you can take them to doggy daycare, and they do fine when they're off leash, but you put that leash on immediately. And even dogs that they are friendly with off leash they will actually be reactive to on. My own Airedale that's going through her little fear period. Um, the other day I brought her in, she comes to work with me every day and I brought her into my house and for whatever reason, I didn't take her leash off and she ran into the living room where my other dogs are and where my dad's dog um, is also and he's visiting from out of town. And I went to grab the leash to go ahead and unclip her um, harness and as soon as I grabbed that leash, she became Cujo. She was barking, lunging, growling at all three dogs. And that's because she was like, wait a minute, if I'm uncomfortable here, I can't do anything else. And so I need to look big and bad um, because I can't flee from the situation. Whereas as soon as I took that off, she tentatively went over and greeted my dad's dog because she's a little bit scared of the little dachshund. Um, and then she greeted her brothers like she normally does. But we can see that sort of dichotomy because of that lack of ability to flee. Now the treatment for leash reactivity is way more complex than if we just trained our dogs initially to ignore prior to the development of it. So if we started from the get-go when our puppies were little to teach them to ignore other dogs on leash and just, hey, just look to mom and get a treat and we move on, we don't greet, we would a lot of times not end up with this leash reactivity. In fact, my colleagues in Europe, they hardly ever have to treat leash reactivity. It's just not a thing. Here, it's probably the number one thing that we see um, in our clinic. All right, so what do we do if our dogs aren't social? So what can be done? What can be done? Well, we're limited, unfortunately. Um, if it's total nature, right, the genetics of both parents, uh, they are both aggressive we're very unlikely to be able to make a significant impact on that dog. Um, but if it was a traumatic event, if we start very, very soon, we soon after that trauma happened, we can really Im be impactful about desensitiz desensitizing and um, counter conditioning to, to their triggers. But what can't be done is oftentimes what owners want, and that's to make this introvert an extrovert. We can't make autistic children all of a sudden understand social norms. 
it's not in their repertoire. Now, can we teach autistic children to uh, reach out a hand and shake a hand when they greet somebody or make eye contact when they meet someone? Yes, we can teach that skill, but it doesn't mean that they are all of a sudden social. So like our leash reactive um, classes and, you know, that they have it your dog's friend, if they open back up again, as well as at my facility, um, what we're teaching those dogs is a skill. When you see another dog, you look to your, your mom or dad, you get a treat and we move on with our walk. But that doesn't mean that we're creating a social dog. We're not making that dog into an extrovert that is now going to be able to go to dog parks, now going to be able to go to um, doggy daycare. That dog may never be able to greet any dog ever, but we're actually going to eliminate the reactivity piece through the training. And so a lot of times we have to figure out, you know, what, um, who are you doing this for? So my owners will come in, you know, with their, with their reactive dog and whether it be reactive towards people or other dogs. And they're like, I just want to take this dog to the cafes or, you know, to Starbucks and be able to sit there and enjoy a cup of coffee. But what if your dog doesn't want to do that? That's something enjoyable for you, but that's not necessarily enjoyable for your dog. And especially true if you are sitting at a Starbucks on, you know, Connecticut Avenue, where there are hundreds of other people and hundreds of dogs going by on a regular basis, that is not going to be enjoyable for that dog. So we have to remember why we're doing it, who we're doing it for, um, and sort of what our constraints and limitations are as we move through treatment. So one of the things that I talk to owners about is grieving the dog that you wanted. When you get the dog that, you know, from the cute little puppy from the rescue or cute little Ike Pike here from his breeder, you have these visions of what you want to do with this dog. With Ike, I really wanted to do agility. I haven't had an agility dog before and being, you know, a trainer myself, I really wanted to get into agility with him and thought that he would be a really good prospect. He came from a great genetic line. Um, I did my research and unfortunately what I did not know is the lack of socialization that the breeder did. Um, I had gotten recommendations from friends, but that doesn't always pan out as we know. And then around four months of age, um, he, I had taken him to a uh, church potluck and we were doing a lot of socialization at that time with uh, new people. And unfortunately a child, um, shouldn't say child, he was probably junior high, early high school age um, kid came running up to him and said, you know, oh my God, he's so cute and went to give him a big old hug. And unfortunately, after that trauma event, um, Ike was reactive towards people. So while I have done a ton of work and I can meet, he, he's also on medication, <laughs> we'll talk about that, but I can meet new people. Um, he, he greets, you know, we had a new babysitter coming in for the summer and he met uh, Sam in a fashion, uh, in his protocol, the way that we do it. And he's now best buds with her and she comes in and he gets all wiggly, just like he does with the rest of the family. But that doesn't mean that I can take him to an agility venue. He's not going to, we're not going to be able to go through his structured introduction protocol, um, to meet every judge or to meet, you know, the gate, the person who does the gate, he just can't handle it. And so I had to grieve the fact that while I wanted to do agility, that wasn't what Ike all of a sudden wanted to do. And, and that's okay. He has a lot of enjoyment. You can see his very, very best enjoyment right there in front of him there is his Kong tennis balls. He loves to play fetch with um, Kong balls, only Kong tennis balls. Don't try and give him a, you know, a pen tennis ball or anything like that. But um, it's not what I had envisioned getting into. Um, but unfortunately, I had to make sure that his wants and desires were at the top most of my, um, my treatment plan. So accept the dog in front of you um, and grieve the dog that you lost to a certain degree and determine wants versus needs. Again, a want is the want to do agility with him, but it's not a need. I don't need to do agility. Now, Ike also has handling issues as far as like ears and um, toenails and grooming is concerned. Those are needs. And those are things that I work on very, very regularly. You may have seen my, um, I did a previous webinar on handling stuff with um, and cooperative care and Ike featured very prominently in most of those videos because I do a lot of work with him, but that's a need. Um, he has to be groomed. He's a giant schnauzer. He has to have his nails trimmed. He has to get shots. He has to get examined. And so 
I wasn't going to put in work to try and counter condition him to an agility arena because that was my want and not his. Okay. So let's talk about how we treat release reactivity just very briefly. We can use management tools and techniques. So management really is trying to avoid the trigger. So there are management tools such as like a gentle leader, um, a freedom harness so that we can easily direct our dog um, in behind a car, parked car or across the street or into a driveway when we see another dog coming. Um, techniques such as going, you know, going to church parking lots during um, not on Sundays or Friday nights and walking around the church parking lot, going to a um, remote uh, hike during the week so that way we don't encounter other dogs. Those are all management strategies. Then there's the behavior modification, which I sort of briefly touched on. We're going to teach the dog, what do we want you to do instead of lunging, barking, growling at another dog as we walk down the sidewalk. And oftentimes there are medication interventions. And medication is only appropriate when we are under unable to keep the animal under threshold, meaning that their environment is such that there are so many dogs or that there are very few sort of management um, techniques that we can use in order to keep that dog under under threshold so that the learning and the behavior modification can actually take place. So oftentimes, um, especially in the city, more so in the city than in the suburbs, um, we have to implement medication for these dogs to be able to really cope with that fear, anxiety, and stress that they are experiencing on a regular basis. I also hear this from clients a lot who have a dog who is unsocial is, can I ever get another dog? Um, and the answer is maybe, maybe not. Um, Dogs, again, are not pack animals. Um, they actually, in the wild, if we look at uh, quote unquote feral uh, domesticated dogs, so like in populations like in, in Puerto Rico where they've got, you know, the island dogs running around, we, the dogs don't hang out in packs. They do have those preferred associates where they have, you know, two, three, maybe four or five dogs that they get along with but they very rarely ever sleep with that dog or snuggle with that dog. And they very rarely ever actually eat side by side with that dog. They're gonna do their own hunting and their own scavenging. Um, and so that is not something that they, it's not like they sit around and hang out with their companions all the time. They may wander the streets with one another, but then you know they may you know run off this direction um, to go hunt if they're hungry or to go rest in a shady spot without their friend. Um, so the same is true with our pet dogs. They're going to have loose associations. And I, I like to think about picking out dogs for our household or picking out cats for our household as like the college, uh, your college picking out your um, undergraduate roommate. So when I went to college, um, I had the pleasure of rooming with my very best friend. Um, and thankfully, we were best friends and got along fantastic and did really well with one another. But not everybody has that opportunity. And sometimes the college picks who you live with. Sometimes that can be great. Sometimes it doesn't go so well, right? Um, so that's how we are doing basically when we get new roommates for these pets of ours. Sometimes it works out really well. They are able to become um, at, at best or at worst rather um, coexistent. Um, at best, maybe they play and they're friendly, um, but most often they're not going to share resources very well. Um, and we're going to have to manage that appropriately. And they may not be the best of friends. So even with a dog that's really unsocial, we can actually potentially introduce another dog as long as we get the right fit for that dog. And that's the key. And that's honestly the most difficult part. So how do we introduce unfamiliar dogs? Well, the first thing that we recommend is doing uh, parallel walks. So this is where both dogs are on leash with two different handlers. They may start as far apart as across the street from one another and get closer and closer together as we move forward with the walk. But we're going to need to monitor body language the entire time. So we're going to look at the body language. Is it loose, wiggly, comfortable? Are they, you know, maybe not even focused on the other dog? Maybe they're focused on what's going on in front of them and, and sniffing along their little walk. But body language is going to give us the clues as to whether we can uh, bring those dogs closer together 
And how fast are we going to be able to do this? And then we oftentimes we want to we want to ideally end on neutral territory. So not necessarily back in one of the dog's backyards or in one of the dog's houses. Um, neutral territory could be like a neighbor's backyard or a dog park that's empty um, and fenced in. And then we will proceed with um, off leash greetings. Once we're able to introduce those dogs appropriately outside, we need to be able to manage resources indoors. If dogs are gonna fight, most often it's going to be over resources and resources can be resting spots, water bowls, uh, food bowls, food, chews, bones, toys, um, and our human attention. So especially if we have a dog that already trends towards resource guarding, we're going to have to be really, really diligent about managing resources so that it doesn't perceive the new dog as a threat to those resources. And that can be hard. So just to give you some ideas about body language, I love this graphic by Lily Chen. Um, you can actually access this on her website and it gives you all of the different body postures and the social repertoire of the dog because that's really what, what they are. Is they are these nonverbal little um, social beings and their, their nonverbal signals are gonna tell us how they feel in a moment. We can also use the ladder of aggression. So the ladder of aggression, you can also access um, either through the BSABA, which is the British Small Animal Veterinary Association Manual of Canine and Feline Behavioral Medicine. Um, you can also find it online. In fact, I found this one on Google Images um, the other day. And what this shows is the green, yellow, and orange, and then up to the red, the signals that a one dog would give to another dog to say, I don't mean you any harm, but you're kind of making me uncomfortable, so please back off. So we call those initial signals, the green into the yellow ritualized appeasement gestures that tells that dog, hey, not, com not fully comfortable with you, um, but I just don't mean you any harm. Then we have displacement behaviors that gets into the um, yellow and orange signals. And that's saying, I'm really uncomfortable here and I'm trying to minimize my stress by displacing it. And then we have avoidance uh, strategies. So, all right, I'm going to try and get away from you because you are clearly not listening to me. And if that doesn't happen, then we have aggression. So these are all things that will that you can look at in your dog to say, are they being social with that dog, or actually are they being uncomfortable? Are they uncomfortable with that other dog? All right, so the take-home points that I want to make is number one, that sociability is a spectrum. So um, for those of you that are uh, older like me, this we used to call this the bell curve. It's now called Gaussian distribution, um, which is a fancy term for saying everything kind of lies on a spectrum. Now, studies have not been done to determine is, uh, is dog sociability a perfect curve or does it skew one way or the other? And I would like to say, and Anecdotally, I suspect that it probably skews more towards the unsocial side of the spectrum, that more and more dogs that we see are have not been properly socialized. Part of that is, you know, we rescue, we rescue a lot of dogs, and that's great. Obviously, I'm very pro-rescue, but they sometimes lack social, socialization. They sometimes lack good maternal nutrition. And when you have all of those factors stacked against you, you're going to trend more towards the unsocial side. And so if you have a dog that is a super extrovert, like my dog loves everybody, consider yourself really, really lucky because you are out on that little tail curve of what you have there. And, you know, maybe there's some breed things going on there, right? Like our golden retrievers. Um, one of the things that they are certainly known to be, have been bred for is their sociability with other dogs. But if the breeder is not focused on behavior, we could be getting more asocial um, golden retrievers. And I definitely have seen that more and more in the past uh, few years. And introverts and extroverts in the dog world exist. We don't like everybody, nor do our dogs. Um, I am very much an introvert. Um, I uh, very much like to be by myself. I was an only child, so I equate it to, to equate it to that. And so being around a lot of people really does drain me. I can do it, but it does drain me. And so there are dogs like that too. Now, if a dog is like me and I'm what is called an extroverted introvert, I can turn it on and I can be bubbly and, and very social in a social setting, but it really, really does drain me. And then I have to go decompress by myself. 
if a dog like me goes to doggy daycare and is super social, plays with all the other dogs for an hour, they may then need a good hour and a half, two hour nap to decompress before they're able to then do it again. Now for me, I need a good week. I can pretty much only do one social event per week because that's how much recovery I really need from it. Um, and so dogs are going to be on that spectrum too. So there are going to be some dogs that maybe can go to doggy daycare once a month and they're good with that. Um, I don't think any dog should go to doggy daycare Monday through Friday. I don't think any dog is that pro-social um, in, in my opinion. I think they're all kind of cranky toddlers by the end of the week. And then the other thing that we need to remember is do dogs actually have to socialize with other dogs to lead a fulfilled and enriched life? And the answer is no. So again, dogs not being pack animals, they do not have to have socialization or socializing opportunities with other dogs in order to have enrichment. You can do a lot of enrichment with your pet and make sure that they live a very fulfilled life as an only child with no dog interactions, with no leash greetings with other dogs. All they need is you and mental stimulation and positive reinforcement training and lots of fun times um, with their family. And that's the most important part. So don't feel like you are giving up on your dog or not providing them with what they need if they don't socialize with other dogs because they really don't need that. And especially the ones on the introverted end of that scale, they don't need it at all. So some of the resources that I want to put out there for you guys, the first is um, Lily Chin's book, Doggy Language. It is fantastic. She's got all of her drawings in there about um, those nonverbal signals that dogs give to say how they're feeling. And so this is a great book to learn uh, what your dog is thinking and feeling at any um, moment in time. And then Patricia McConnell's uh, and Karen London's uh, sort of pamphlet book called Feeling Outnumbered. This is how to manage and enjoy your multi-dog household. So it's really how you should set up and appropriately manage a uh, multi-dog household because many of us have those. Um, we have those college roommates that we've put together. So how are we going to make sure that they stay good friends and not mortal enemies? And then the other one that I mentioned is Kim Brophy's uh, book, Meet Your Dog. And um, that is a really great resource, especially for behaviorists and trainers um, looking to look into breed uh, tendencies and also owners of those types of breeds in case you're not familiar um, with sort of their behavioral traits and repertoires. Um, and then, like I said, I will try and find that, uh, that podcast uh, with Jessica Heckman. I'll try and put it in the chat um, during the Q&A portion. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to the chat box and, um, and maybe Deborah can yeah. also, oh, look at that. We've got those resources there already. Thank you, Nicole. Nicole, can you find oh, the um, podcast I was talking about? <laughs> Somebody mentioned something about that podcast. But okay. We need a link. We have some very good, good, good questions. Excellent. Well, well run me yeah. through them, Deborah, because it looks like there's a lot of chat that I must have missed. Um, yeah. Okay. Unfortunately, I wrote these down in my handwriting. So <laughs> I can't read it. <laughs> oh, well, I may go down the chat instead. Um, okay, let's see. The podcast by Jessica Heppen, by the way, um, Michelle said uh, that it was talked about in Drinking from the Toilet. It was talked about on Drinking from the Toilet, so that is... Um... Hannah Brannigan's podcast, but the one that I'm thinking about was not that one. Um, I will try and find it. I'm going to do a little Google while we're answering questions. Okay. The first one is, is there research on the secondary fear period? That's a really good question. And unfortunately, there is not. Um, the problem with the research uh, that was done to develop the timeline of the socialization period is now that research would actually be considered unethical. Um, they had to isolate animals during that period from their, um, from their litter mates. They had to isolate them from their mother. And those are completely considered unethical for 
for obvious and good reasons. Um, and right now, there's unlikely anything that we could possibly do to definitively prove that secondary fear period without doing some isolation studies. Um, so other than just sort of anecdotal, like, yes, a most of us see this um, anecdotally anywhere from about seven to 12 months, depending on the dog. Um, that's all we can really say about it. Okay. What is the best behavior that the owner has to keep during an encounter, meaning a leash walk of other dogs with a fearful dog? Yeah. So one of the best things that you can do, number one, is to get your dog to look at you. Um, so you can teach a watch me cue or you can use a hand target um, to get that dog to turn away from staring at the other dog. And then also teach a what we call an emergency U-turn. So teaching the dog that, hey, there's a dog coming towards you, but you know what? We have the opportunity to escape and that's okay. It's okay to escape your fears, right? Like I don't want to, um, or avoid your fears rather. I don't want to jump out of a perfectly good airplane with a parachute on my back. I'm not going to do it. Um, that is very much a fear of mine is falling out of an airplane. So um, you can totally do that by teaching the dog, you don't have to encounter that other dog on a leash. You can turn around and hightail it the other way. And if we cue that with like an emergency U-turn, um, uh, depends on what, what trainer you use, what they want to call it, but just somehow trying to get out of Dodge. Um, I know that at Joyful Dog, uh, LLC.com, mm -hmm. there's an article and a, a Lily Chin graphic. Yes, you're right. Emergency recall. So yeah. if you guys want to write that down, it's joyfuldogllc.com. And you'll see in the blog something mm -hmm. about emergency. What it turnarounds? That's yeah, emergency U-turn something. Yeah, that's it. Um, okay, if your dog is anxious and reactive some of the time, not all of the time, is it better to keep walking or to stop, sit and stay and have them hold that? Yeah. So I actually don't prefer a, so a stop, sit and stay. And, and the reason is because um, if you think about when you are fearful of something, like for me, it'd be spiders. I have two very weird, well, not weird, but spiders and falling out of airplanes. Those are my two biggest fears. Um, so let's say I'm walking down the sidewalk and there is a ginormous tarantula coming towards me. If my friend who is with me told, told me, just sit, just hang out. Don't worry. It's going to go by you. Let's just stay here. I would literally have a panic attack. Whereas if I knew I had to get by that spider in order to get back home or to get where I was going, and my friend said, let's run as fast as we can by it, I would feel so much better about that, right? Like, okay, I can do this. I can handle it, but I'm going to run as fast as I possibly can. So I actually don't prefer the stop and stay. I prefer either managing it by, you know, hopping into the street and getting as much distance um, between that trigger and you or if you don't have that option to run by as fast as possible and be like, no worries, it's fine. Everything is fine here, right? Like if I met my friend was going, hey, let's go get cheesecake. Come on, let's run. I'd be like, okay, I can run past the spider. So, so that's sort of my technique um, for when it comes to kind of walking down the street. Okay. Um, can too early castration have an effect on anxiety, insecurity, sociability? Yeah, so there are now three studies out looking at three different breeds. Um, so these are very breed specific studies um, that showed pediatric uh, spay and neuter, which means spay and neuter um, six months or younger. Um, those dogs had a higher likelihood of certain fears and phobias. Um, and it was different between all three breeds. So it's not like they all had stranger danger or all had dog reactivity. Um, it just was various fears and phobias than their counterparts that were spayed or neutered later in life, meaning sexual maturity and beyond. So they, I think they said, I think they split it up into like nine months and older. Um, and so now a lot of clinicians, myself included, are trying to push spay and, spay and neuter 
if we can, to at least sexual maturity. Um, so like my own, uh, my own Airedale, she's currently going through a heat cycle and then I will spay her in about four months. And that's number one for bone growth. We know that that's important as well. Those hormones um, are impo important for large breed dogs, especially, um, but also for fears and phobias. So the hard part is, can we make that a global um, recommendation? And, and the answer is no, for a variety of reasons. Number one, because again, those were three, three breeds that they looked at. They also, the dogs that were not pediatric spayed and neutered, those were dogs that were living in show homes, um, people that plan to breed their dogs. And so unfortunately, those are not quote unquote, average dog owners. Um, and we know that before we required pediatric spay and neuter 20 years ago, we were overrun with the pet population in the United States. And so, so there's a lot of things that come into play, but if I have an owner that is, you know, going to make ensure that their in heat female is not going to jump the fence and go meet with the neighbor dog or um, can handle some of the uh, sexually mature behaviors such as urine marking um, and the potential for running away when there is an in-season female nearby or the in-season female themselves, um, then and they're willing to wait through that period of time, then I'm going to encourage that they do. Um, but dogs coming out of rescue, we can't guarantee that the new owner would spay or neuter. And so rescue organizations are still going to need to do that prior to adoption. Um, so it's not, it's a, not a perfect uh, world and not a perfect answer for every pet. Do you do anything different during desensitization counter conditioning for owners whose dogs have leash reactivity only with a specific individual holding the leash. Yes, um, for that for that dog, number one, you would want to teach the skills of what you're going to have them do. If that's going to be a look at me and move on, or an emergency U-turn first without that handler, so the dog gets the skills under their belt um, when they are under threshold, and then we're going to need to once the dog is 100% uh, reliable in the in that skill set, then we're going to need to transfer that behavior to when they are working with the one particular handler, and that's probably going to take an increased distance away. Um, like it may be, you know, instead of, you know, being able to pass right by another dog, obviously it, with the new hand, with the one particular handler, they're going to need to make sure that they have at least 50 yards or, you know, a football field length uh, away, which sometimes can be really hard, but um, yeah, it's, it's just going to be very individualized to that one particular person. Is there any science that says adult dogs need to have interactions with other dogs? Absolutely none. No, there's no supporting evidence of that. Um, and again, some dogs are really social and do enjoy interactions with other dogs and some don't. So you have to know your dog. Can you share Ike's breeding protocol with new people? Yeah. Yeah. His is very um, particular because he is so obsessed with his uh, tennis ball. Um, what we do is we have the people come in first. He's crated upstairs. People come in first. They go out to the back patio. They have a handful of tennis balls on them. We let Ike out. He comes out to the patio. He's so focused on the tennis ball. He doesn't even know who's throwing it, to be perfectly honest. They throw the tennis ball off the patio. He goes and chases it, brings it back to that person. And literally he's like, oh my God, you're my best friend because you just threw my ball. So that was developed um, by trial and error a little bit because initially we did start, we tried to have it happen indoors, tried to have it happen with people coming in the garage door versus the front door because we know that dogs sort of distinguish like, oh, strangers come through the front door, but the family comes in through the garage door. Um, we use treats first and, and we found through trial and error that he really needed to be outside. So he had as much space as possible. And that ball was absolutely key for him. So every, every animal's protocol is, is gonna be different. Can birth complications impact a dog's mental health? Birth complications, yes. Yeah, the absolutely. Dog was born by emergency C-section, 
and only he and one sibling survive. Um, he engages in compulsive sucking behavior. He looks like a, a puppy nursing when yeah. overwhelmed. Yeah, so um, absolutely, because if they lacked oxygen in utero during the birth process, um, that can happen if it took them a while to revive the puppies. Because when you do a C-section, the puppies don't automatically come out breathing. Um, and normally the mom immediately after birth is gonna lick all, lick all the um, placenta and everything off the puppy and stimulate them to breathe. But that job then goes to the veterinary nurses that are on hand for um, the C-section. And so if it took them a while to get them to actually breathing, there's going to be a lack of oxygen. Um, the suckling behavior as sort of a comfort behavior, I have found most often when puppies are weaned too early. Um, so they sort of retain that need to suckle on something um, and, and it becomes a displacement, stress relieving behavior for them. But, but not all dogs um, that do that behavior were weaned early, but obviously your dog has anxiety. Can you comment on what it looks like when a dog is having fun at doggy daycare versus surviving doggy daycare? <laughs> yeah, well, there's going to be um, a lot of variety amongst this. Number one, who they're playing with at the time, um, you know, time of day, if they're tired or not, all that kind of stuff. But the extremes that I, and that I have seen very, very commonly, we have the dog that is literally cowering in the corner and not wanting to engage in any way, shape or form with other dogs. That's kind of obviously the very not happy to be there. We also have the dogs that perhaps are walking the perimeter, but they're not engaging with other dogs. Those are the more subtle ones that I find that people are like, oh, but they're getting exercise. Well, no, they're probably pacing around because they're uncomfortable and they don't wanna to stop too long to let a dog come sniff them, that type of thing. You can have the dogs that just want to like sit on top of, you know, the slide or the box that's provided and just kind of view everything, but they don't actually engage in play. And then there are the dogs that are actually playing. So you're seeing them do play bows, which is that downward dog yoga pose. You're seeing loose, wiggly body language. They're, you know, bouncing back and forth. Now they may take breaks and, you know, become that dog that lays up on the box or lays, um, you know, off to the side, but they're comfortable enough in that setting to actually relax. Dogs that are vigilant um, and watching for eight hours straight are not happy. Um, so it's just, there's so many, so many things I could describe all the way from one into the other, but that's sort of the ones that I've seen on video that sort of stand out to me um, at dog daycare. Is there a way to test how well your dog will do with a specific dog breed? She has a men pin who's been attacked several times by larger dogs, mm -hmm. and she would like to uh, get a Doberman. Oh, um, so you would need to expose them to a Doberman that you knew was very pro-social, so a dog that has really good social skills. Um, Unfortunately, that's not necessarily the dog that you're going to get, though. Um, and so you're going to have to go about doing um, introductions appropriately, whether this be to, to another puppy or to an um, already adult dog. You're probably going to have to keep them separated for quite a while until, um, until your min pin gets very comfortable seeing, seeing the other dog maybe across uh, the house and use treats and counter conditioning. I would really, really encourage you to employ a trainer, a positive reinforcement based trainer that can help you go about through the introduction process. This one's interesting given that you have such a backlog. Um, do you <laughs> virtual consults or consults with just the owner. I yeah. live far away with no behaviorist anywhere near, but have a daughter I visit in Fairfax. Oh, um, well, we would be happy to see you in Fairfax if you come here. Unfortunately, the state of Virginia does not allow me to do virtual consults for initial consults. That means your very first consultation would have to be in person, um, but we do a lot of Zoom and remote stuff for follow-up, so that's an option. Um, as Deborah said, we are about six months out on our um, appointment list right now, as are the other 
uh, two behaviorists here in town too. So I'm not alone. Um, we have a couple options. There are vet to vet consults available. So my partner, Dr. Amy Learn in Richmond, can do vet to vet consults, meaning um, she can speak to your veterinarian um, and you would be involved in the process. It would actually be a sort of a three-way Zoom call um, to develop a good treatment plan. And then if they could find you a good trainer locally um, that could work on the behavior modification process with you, um, that would be the ideal situation. Otherwise, like I said, you're welcome to come down to Fairfax um, when you're visiting your daughter and we would love to see you in the office. Um, Robin, you could contact them now for an appointment when you come down for Thanksgiving. Absolutely. That Deborah's That's not one idea. Out. That's about yeah. six months. That, I mean, you are, you are correct, Deborah. That's how, that's how long we're unfortunately waiting right now. Part of that is um, COVID. We've got all these COVID animals um, with lots of behavioral issues. But um, also, I am going to be taking on a new resident in September. And so our schedules will open up just a little bit um, starting in September, hopefully. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah. Um, okay. I have a reactive foster dog. How do I take him to meet and greet events in the hope of finding him a forever home if he goes nuts in public? Yeah, unfortunately, you are probably not going to be able to do that um, unless you are able to get enough distance away, like maybe stand, you know, way down the sidewalk, um, you know, if the if the group is sort of gathered in front of the pet smart, so to speak, um, like way down the sidewalk. But a lot of these dogs, unfortunately, they can't be in group settings and they're not going to be able to show their best face um, in a group setting like that. The other consideration um, is to use an event-based medication to make sure that he is as comfortable as possible in one of those settings. Um, and you can certainly talk to the veterinarian associated with the rescue about that possibility. Okay, there's some more about the podcast you mentioned. Um, it's yeah, I've been Googling the whole time. Sports. I can't really find it. Well, it's on Fenzie Dog Sports. Look under resources, blogs. It's a Fenzie, yeah, Fenzie on did list. one too. Um, I don't think that's the one though that I was looking it at. It says she, this, duh, Jessica Heckman was also on the Cog Dog Radio podcast with Sarah Streming. That's the one I'm thinking of. Yep, it's the Sarah Streming um, Cog Dog Radio. Yep, you got it. Ding, 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 whoever got that one, that's the one I listened to. Yeah, we've got very educated. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, I got my lab mix rescue at seven months. She seemed okay with other dogs on walks. But at around age one, she suddenly became aggressive. I can no longer walk her as she reacts to other dogs. She becomes very aggressive if she sees children or bicycles, even from inside the house, looking out the window. Do you want me to go into like treatment for that, Deborah? Or? I don't know. I <laughs> That is, I mean, definitely that's what I'm very, dealing with that, that's really common, um, unfortunately, and you're going to need the combination of management um, strategies, behavior modification, and potentially medication, too, since her triggers are so frequent um, and on a very regular basis. And could that have been that secondary fear period? Where could have been the secondary fear fine. period. It could have also been combined with a little bit of a honeymoon period. So um, many, many dogs and people do the same thing. Uh, they honeymoon in a new situation. So they don't always show their true behavioral repertoire. Um, and so once they get comfortable in their new home, then they'll sort of uh, go back to their, their normal, quote unquote, behavior. So it might be sort of a combination of both of those. Uh, Christine is asking a question about whether the fact that her dog had a serious medical trauma at around 10 to 12 months could be part of, of her dog's fear-based aggression. Absolutely. Um, we know that dogs under a year of age that had um, serious medical concerns, this was a research, um, uh, gosh, done in like the 50s or 60s, um, looking at dogs with early uh, onset, like parvo disease, hospitalization, fractures, those types of things under a year of age, those dogs were more likely to have fear and anxiety-based um, behaviors later on. Is it now okay 
to socialize puppies before all vaccinations? If so, how? Absolutely. So there has to be done safely because obviously we want to minimize still that potential risk for um, disease transmission. So number one, you would not want to take them to dog parks. You would not want to take them to pet stores, places where dogs are going that may not necessarily be vaccinated. If you have friends with dogs that you know their health status and you know that your friends are keeping up on their vaccine status and these dogs are social um, and would not be, you know, traumatizing to your puppy, that's where I would go is I would go to friends' houses. You could go to puppy socialization classes. So I know YDF ran one, we run them too. In those classes, the way that they work is the puppy has to have been owned for seven to 10 days, which means that uh, if they are um, seven to 10 days in the new home, they will have already broken with um, signs of disease if they got it before the um, new owner uh, had the dog. So what, that's what we're looking for is to make sure that they don't have signs of respiratory illness, um, vomiting, diarrhea, that type of thing. And they have to have at least one of their distemper parvo vaccines and their Bordetella. Um, so if that is the case, and if the place is using good sanitation techniques and making sure that they're excluding dogs with illness, then you are safe to be able to go there. So there are many, many good puppy socialization classes here in the DMV area um, that do a very, very good job about um, making sure that we're not going to risk disease transmission. But this isn't permission, again, to go to a dog park or, um, you know, just a regular park even where dogs might be pooping um, and shedding the parvovirus, those types of things. But you can, you can do a very, very good job socializing within the confines of uh, being safe. There also were a lot of articles during COVID on mm, yes. socialize your dog during COVID. Yeah. Um, you can probably Google that topic and, and see some of them. Yeah, I, I saw a lot of those were like, go to a park, but sit in your car. Um, and, you know, you sit with the puppy in the car and skateboarders are going by and, you know, you're feeding treats the whole time. And um, so that way they can get socialized, but they're not actually touching the ground. Um, and, and obviously during COVID, we were wanting not to interact socially on the human side of things too. So we're at a, at a good distance where we can eliminate disease transmission. Okay. Um, we have two new under-socialized dogs, a bonded pair rescued from the same situation who are doing fairly well with their new humans after three weeks, but still scared with other people and sometimes still with us. At what point would you recommend working with a professional trainer? Right now, immediately. The sooner we intervene, the better, because um, what's happening is learning is taking place all this time. And if they have experiences where they're scary um, and we're not keeping them under threshold appropriately, we're going to solidify those fears later. So you need help ASAP. Why is my young dog in the second fear phase more fear aggressive with strangers when I'm not home and other people she is familiar with around? Oh, when you're not home, um, mm -hmm. there's, I mean, there's a couple of reasons. Actually, sometimes we see it the opposite where they're, they're more aggressive in our presence. Um, one of two things could be happening. So if it's in your presence, it's most likely because you're their safe safety net, your backup, their backup crew, um, so to speak. And so they're more likely to be confident enough to use aggression as a behavioral strategy. The opposite could happen when you're not there because they are so much more scared because you are not there. Um, so, so really that is sort of a compliment to you that you are their safety net um, and that that's where they feel most comfortable is in your presence. But um, making sure that we're working through this in a very positive fashion keeping that dog under threshold and um, desensitizing and counter conditioning is gonna be really, really key so this behavior doesn't solidify for you. Is there research connecting puppy tail docking and ear cropping to anxiety? Hmm. There is not that I know of. Um, and thankfully, 
we're trying to get more and more away from cosmetic procedures like that. Um, they are banned in all of Europe um, and they don't teach them anymore in veterinary school, just so you know, even 20 years ago, I graduated 20 years ago and uh, we did not learn how to crop tails or dock ears. Um, and so we're trying to phase that out here in the States as well. And hopefully again, one of those things in my lifetime, I would love to see go away. Um. Someone put, and I think it may have come just to me, Kim Brophy has developed The Dog's Truth, a short course for dog owners based on Meet Your Dog. Oh, great. It releases on May 30th. Oh, fantastic. The I love it. The book Kim. is out of print, but will be back in print any day now. Oh, excellent. <laughs> I love it. And and when I went on Amazon to find that that logo, um, they had the Kindle version. So you can certainly get um, get it on your uh, on your device. And then I think there is um, an audiobook version as well, but I could be incorrect. Okay, since I don't know if that went to everyone, I am going to copy and paste that to everyone so you can see the link, etc. Okay. This is why people need to show up instead of watching. The video. <laughs> That's right. Tell your friends. Um, okay. Let's see where we are now. You guys really are incredibly knowledgeable. I, they're giving each other advice and research. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Uh, my dog loves to meet other dogs, but shows frustration when it's time for them to leave. She mm -hmm. works and throws a temper tantrum like a toddler. How can I help her not get so frustrated? Yeah, one of the things that I would really recommend is right now avoid leash greetings until you can have a skill under your belt for how to redirect her positively in those moments. Um, and one of the best things may be for her. And, and again, one of the things about training is I'm, I have to train the dog in front of me so I can create the most wonderful protocol and it may not necessarily work for this particular dog. So, so the caveat to this is it may not necessarily work for your dog, but what the first thing that I would try would be to, if the other dog is about to leave, asking the owner, hey, you guys sit tight. We're going to be the ones to leave the situation, not the other dog. And then uh, use your emergency U-turn or like just a high happy voice, be like, come on, come on and like kind of run away as fast as possible um, to see if we can avoid that frustration stance. Uh, two people have questions about mounting behavior because they see it happening more with their own dogs. Mm -hmm. So mounting behavior most often, um, unless your dog is uh, sexually intact and he's mounting uh, an intact female um, is frustration behavior. So it's, it's a displacement. So it's a normal behavior uh, and in the dog's social repertoire, but it's seen at times when they are stressed or frustrated. And so they can um, take that frustration out by humping a person. It can, they can hump another dog. Um, it's unlikely a dominance trait. Um, and most often is because of anxiety and frustration. Okay, Vicki has a question that I'm not sure you can answer. I think we can okay. tell you. How do we prevent people from sending their dogs to dog boot camps and the dog comes home with a shock collar? Oh my gosh, I know. <laughs> I wish I could answer that. You're right, Deborah. I can't, unfortunately. Um, you know, shock collars are banned in all of Europe and probably about 60% of Canada. Um, I don't think we'll ever get to that point in the U.S. just because that's us as a culture. Um, and, but the more education that we put out about the negative impacts about these callers, the more um, information we can get to other owners, uh, the better. Um, and I see the fallout of, from these dogs every single day in practice. They've gone to, to boot camps because the owners thought, oh, this was going to cure a behavior or it's going to make me, you know, an, an obedient dog or whatever. And they come home with shock collars and a ton of fear and anxiety that later turns to aggression. So. Um, I don't know that this will help, but we just put up a new uh, positive dog training slideshow. Oh, great. Um, 
that Marnie Montgomery of Joyful Dog, their mm-hmm. Joyful Dog is again, um, designed and wrote. Fabulous. The sidebar on our website. So look at it, see if you think other people looking at it would help them not go to boot camps and use shock collars. I don't know. I, I've talked to people I know, like my dentist, about his dog using a shock collar and yeah. didn't get me anywhere. <laughs> I know, <laughs> unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, how do you explain stopping or reducing visits to doggy daycare for a dog that the owner believes loves daycare, but you see an anxious dog that is only surviving daycare? Yeah, pointing out the body language. So if they have video of the dog in daycare, pointing out um, on that ladder of aggression or via those uh, lily chin drawings of what is actually happening, because until the owner sees that and recognizes that, they may not understand. Um, but body language is key. The dog is telling us what how it's feeling. And that can be really hard, um, you know, because I know a lot of people send their dogs to doggy daycare because they feel guilty that they're not home or they're not as engaging as they think they should be during the day. Um, and so we're taking that that only option away from them, um, but it's for the dog's welfare that we point those out. Okay. I think it's possible that I've gotten through all the questions. Oh. I'm, I'm- won't swear to it, but um, I do want to mention to all of you that if you go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash your dog's friend, we have all of the previous webinars and they're divided in sections to help you find what you're looking for. And um, it, it will ans- they, they will answer some of the questions that you've had. Um, now questions are coming in. Okay, wait a second. I've been following, where is this? It's about European something, using muzzles. What is your opinion of using muzzles? I'm a huge proponent of muzzle training. Um, We use basket muzzles all the time in the practice. And in fact, in our puppy classes, we teach basket muzzle training as well, because you never know when your dog is going to have to need a muzzle, whether it be, you know, the periodic cicadas that came out last year, right? The dogs are all gobbling them up and getting sick, um, or they're trying to eat chicken bones off the streets in DC, or they're in pain and they need something done at the veterinary office. And if the dog is fully trained to the muzzle early on, it's going to be so key. In fact, I was, uh, we do train this in our puppy class. And obviously I sent my own, uh, I went with my own Airedale puppy to our puppy classes and worked on muzzle training with her. So she is 11 ish months now, I think 10 and a half, almost 11 months. Um, and the other day I had an Airedale patient come in that I couldn't touch. And I was like, you know what, I'll just go back to my office and I'll, um, I'll size my own Airedale for a muzzle. And that way we know that, that it'll fit yours because they looked very similar body size and they were the same weight. So I went back to my office and I grabbed the muzzle, um, that my nurse, uh, handed me and I put it in front of her and she shoved her little face right on in there. And I was like, This is the power of good muzzle training because she doesn't have a negative association with it. She was so happy to throw her little nose in there um, and get treats. So um, by all means, please, please train, train muzzles. It's an amazing tool. Um, There is a video by Sharak Patel, I guess, Mm -hmm. on acclimating your dog to a muzzle. Yes. Um, And also the muzzle up project on um, the web is fantastic um, because they have all kinds of uh, how to's, how to measure, what's the best fit, yada, yada, yada. Yeah, you can probably Google that too, or we have that, we have a section on our website that no one ever looks at called uh, Websites We Love. So Take a look, you'll find things like the Muzzle Up Project. There's some pages I know no one ever looks at. That's <laughs> one of them. Okay, I, it's hard to find the questions between 
people saying how fantastic you are. Oh, thank you guys. Um, do you have any good, re- well, this is probably the muzzle up project resources for fitting a basket muzzle. Yeah. Muzzle up project for sure. They, they go through fit and style and all that kind of fun stuff. Okay. And let's see if there are any questions or if these are just, thank you. We love you. Um, I'll take those too. Uh, <laughs> I love positive reinforcement. <laughs> and I don't understand. Oh, there we go. Dogs that react outwardly toward trigger, triggers versus ones that retreat. So I don't know if this is a question but, or so please tell me if I'm answering it incorrectly. Um, fear is a spectrum. And so you can have anywhere from aggression all the way to completely shut down and anywhere in between. Um, it's just a coping strategy for to minimize that fear. And so some um, some dogs are going to use aggression. Some dogs are going to freeze because they um, are in learned helplessness and some dogs are going to retreat. And wouldn't it be nice if they just retreated? Um, that's the easier uh, or less embarrassing, I will say, for the human um, uh, component of that. But it doesn't mean that anyone is less fearful than the other. Do you have thoughts on the possibility of phantom limb syndrome in tail docked dogs? Um, it's a possibility. The unfortunate thing about phantom limb syndrome is that it takes the um, person with the missing limb to report um, what what they're feeling. And unfortunately, my dogs don't get on the couch and report to me what's going on. So I can't always determine if that's what's happening. Um, sometimes we will do pain control trials in dogs, though, where we suspect that that's a component um, to see if reducing pain um, and decreasing those neuropathic um, transmissions can actually help. So I don't, we just don't have any studies because we can't get, we can't get the reports from the patients. Okay, now I think I'm at the end. Somebody is going to send a question as soon as I say that, but you know, right? Um, <laughs> oh, okay. No, this isn't a question. I don't think. Okay. Um, I also want to remind everybody that um, if you attend a lot of these webinars and you would like to help on the back end with some of the technical issues that come up, uh, let me know because our, our the main person who's been helping us is moving to Germany, uh, which is not good. <laughs> not good for us. Um, Maybe good. And, <laughs> yeah. And again, if you are so inclined, you can donate on our homepage at the uh, top right corner. So with that, I will not promote donations anymore. And uh, thank you very much, Dr. Pike. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for everyone for coming. coming.